What is up, guys? Welcome back to the Wildcast. Hope you're all doing well out there. In this video, we're going to be looking at the latest developments in the US versus Maxwell case, specifically when it comes to the trial logistics. And this is trial logistics part number six. If you want to check out the other prior five parts, I'll link the uh, playlist in the top right hand corner right now, and you can go watch parts one through five. So yesterday I did a video regarding the uh, developments in the teleconferencing we had, and I want to do a slight correction before we move on to the jury questionnaire, which is what we're going to be looking at today. So yesterday I talked about how the judge was not allowing individualized voir dire, but that's not the case. Okay. So it was, it was very unclear during the teleconferencing, what the judge was thinking regarding that. I said that she's not going to be doing that. But today she put out this document on uh, 1022 outlining the outlining what they talked about during the teleconferencing. And she said that she will be allowing individualized voir dire. OK, so voir dire will proceed on November 16th to 19th, and um, the court will conduct one on one voir dire with each prospective juror in the presence of the parties. That's the government and Gillian Maxwell's lawyers and with public ac access to the proceeding. She denied the uh, attorney led voir dire. We talked about that yesterday. So the judge will be conducting one on one voir dire uh, with the uh, with both parties present. So it's going to take longer than than usual voir dire. So voir dire is basically the questioning process where the uh, judge and the two parties ba basically vetting the uh, jurors and determining who is best uh, equipped to hear the case. And uh, and we're talking about the logistics behind that that process. OK, so voir dire is the questioning of the jurors and also the questioning of exp expert witnesses uh, in preparation for the trial. In, in case anybody was unclear, if you've been watching my videos, you should know what voir dire is by this point. Uh, but anyways, that's what it is. So just want to make that correction. Uh, it will be individualized voir dire, but it will be led by the judge. Uh, the judge will be the one who's asking the questions. OK, so I want to make that correction. Now we know for sure. Uh, because I always correct myself if I get something even slightly wrong. Now, that being said, let's move on to the draft jury questionnaire and the draft voir dire. So this was put out by the judge today, and uh, she uh, gave us some details and a draft of what the jury is going to be asked and some of the draft questionnaires for the voir dire as well. So we're going to be I'm going to be giving you guys a taste of what the jury is going to be seeing. This is not the final draft, but this is uh, this was proposed by the judge and the uh, both parties have a chance to. Um, look at it and offer, you know, suggestions and maybe change changes to questions uh, so that the judge can consider it. But the judge is the ultimate arbiter here. She's the one who's going to determine which questions are going to be asked and how they're going to be asked. It starts out with basic instructions on your job as a juror to answer everything honestly, you know, to uh, look at things uh, in an unbiased way. That's the basic instruction here. Then we have a section for the case, um, just giving basic details on what the uh, what the uh, trial is going to be about. So we have some details about Gillian Maxwell and the accusations against her and the f the basic facts of the case that they're going to be hearing. OK, so the basic intro to the case, summary of the case. And then we go through some scheduling stuff, which I'm not going to uh, it's not relevant to you guys, but it's there. Everything that's logistically important to the processes, processes of the trial. She details that here. We start out with uh, the ability to serve. So that section covers whether jurors predict they're going to if they're going to have any kind of, you know, immovable um, interruptions to their ability to come to court. So these are just very bare bones, basic stuff. Right. Do you have any unmovable commitments between November 16th, 2021 and November 19th, which is when uh, jury selection will take place? So that's important. Uh, do you have any unmovable commitments between November 29th, that's when the trial begins, opening arguments, and approximately January 15th, uh, which is the estimated length of the trial? So they're trying to, the judge is trying to get at if the jurors will actually be able to attend the trial all the way through, which is important. Uh, do any circumstances exist such that serving on the jury in this case would uh, entail serious hardship or extreme inconvenience? So these are all things that I've actually answered questions like this. Uh, the California surveys look a little bit different. And uh, to be honest, they were shorter. <laughs> this um, this jury question is very, very long. I showed you guys an example of a California, I think it was a state, state trial, not a federal trial, but uh, it was a California state court trial, the uh, 
the questionnaire that I showed you guys, which was much shorter. It was like seven pages or something. Uh, but this is a federal trial, which with a lot more complications uh, going into it when it comes to the details of the case. Uh, but yeah, anyways, let's keep on going. Do you have any personal commitments that would make it difficult for you to get to court by 930? So again, I'm trying to give you guys an idea of what kind of questions are asked. These are some very basic ones that are asked to make sure that the that the jurors can show up in, show up on time and can show up for the entire trial. Okay, so let's get to the next part. Basic legal principles and media uh, restrictions. Under the law, the facts are for the jury to determine and the law is for the judge to determine. Uh, that that established by these statements, you guys probably have heard that the judge is the trier of law and the jury is the trier of fact. That's that's basically what that is. The, the, that's, that's a very basic underpinning of the U.S. justice system. Uh, you are required to accept the law as the judge explains it to you, even if you do not like the law or disagree with it. And you must determine the facts according to those instructions. Uh, do you accept this principle and will you be able to follow the judge's instructions if selected to serve on this jury? So very, very basic legal principles you have to abide by. So a lot of people have disagreements with the law. I have some disagreements with some existing laws. But when you serve on a jury, you have to agree to follow the law as instructed by the judge. So that's very important and a very foundational part of our legal system. So you have to agree to that because when it comes to the when it comes to the uh, verdict phase when the uh, when the arguments are done when both parties rest then it's up to the jury to uh, deliberate and come up with uh, a verdict guilty or guilty or not guilty based on the law and the evidence that's, that was presented obviously Next, the law provides that a defendant in a criminal case is uh, presumed innocent at all stages of the trial and is not required to put on any defense at all. The government is required to prove the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt on each charge. Do you accept these principles and will you be able to apply them if selected to serve on the jury? Again, important uh, underpinnings of our legal system. The defend defendant is innocent until proven guilty. That's another important principle. And I've talked about this before, going back to Britain. I, I always go back to Britain because the British law is important. Um, the founding fathers wanted a system that was the exact opposite of Britain. Uh, if you know anything about British jurisprudence, you know, back when the kings and the queens had much more power, um, whoever they determined to be guilty were presumed guilty. They rarely ever got a fair trial. So the Constitution, Fifth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, and the Eighth Amendment are very important to the rights of the uh, guilty or the, the alleged criminals. So until you're found guilty by a jury of your peers, you're assumed to be innocent. This was not the case back in the British Empire when it, when it was much more powerful than it is now. And uh, people were thrown in jail for good reasons, bad reasons, and nobody knows. Whatever the uh, king and, uh, and the royal court and sometimes the church decided that's what happened. People had basically had no guaranteed rights. So these these underpinnings of our legal system are very important. In order to understand how valuable they are, they are. you have to understand how bad things were in the colonies and, and back in Britain and all over Europe. It's not just Britain, but Germany, France, all these places. The uh, the kings, kings and queens of Europe ruled with an iron fist and they didn't give many rights to the peasants. So our judicial system is very important. It's based on the principle established in our constitution. And it's all important for all people who are following any uh, American trials to understand our legal system, okay? It's based on very, very good foundations, a very reasonable foundations that guarantees that people are not thrown in jail without a fair trial. So these, these things might seem, you know, redundant or annoying to you guys, but they're very important. I want to talk about that. Okay, now let's keep on going here. The law provides that a defendant in a criminal case has an absolute right not to testify. That's true. And a, uh, and a juror cannot hold it against the defendant if she chooses not to testify. Do you accept this principle? Blah, blah, blah. So you guys get it. These are just questions asking if the jurors can accept the criminal justice system as it exists right now or if they'll have some problems with it. That's what they're asking here. Okay, so let's move on to the next part. This can go on forever if I go on, go, if I read every single question. So next we have uh, some basic questions about prior jury duty, experience as a witness or a defendant or a, a crime victim. So that might be relevant. Have you or have you or any relative or close friend ever participated in a state or federal court case, whether criminal or civil, as a witness? So I would have to answer yes because I have. Um, but these are some basic questions to, questions to establish the jurors' participation in prior legal proceedings relationships with and view of government defense and others so this is important this is established if the jurors are have any kind of uh 
close relationship with any of these parties which are re which are relevant to this case okay so this part is important do you have uh, do you or any member of your family or a close friend work in law or law enforcement the justice system or the courts do you know or have any association, professional, business, or social, direct or indirect, with any member of the staff of the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York? So this is to establish any kind of bias in favor of or against the, those of the U.S. attorneys that are prosecuting this case. Okay, so that's important. Next. Do you, uh, do you know or have any associations, professional, uh, business, or social, uh, direct or indirect, with the Federal Bureau of Investigations? Again, the FBI, I believe they have, some, they have some FBI agents testifying, so that might be relevant to the case. So once again, trying to establish any kind of, um, any kind of association with relevant parties to the case. Okay. Do you have any associations with the New York City Police Department? Another question, uh, because their testimony, I think, will be used in this case as well. There's evidence gathered by the uh, by the NYPD's work. Next, do you have any opinions of the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York, um, U.S. Attorney Williams, or acting U.S. Attorney Audrey Strauss that might make it difficult for you to be a fair and impartial juror in this case? Once again, trying to establish bias in or, uh, for or against the attorneys here from the SDNY. Uh, let's keep on going here. Personal relationship with case participants. Again, related stuff to this, trying to establish bias of the jurors. Um, do you have or does any member of your family or close friend personally know or have past or present dealings with the defendant in this case, Gillian Maxwell, or or her family members. Again, the last part was ha having to do with the attorneys. Now we look at the defense, and uh, and it's very important for friends or enemies of Gillian Maxwell not to sit on the jury, because if you love her as a friend, then you might have a hard time finding her guilty if the evidence uh, shows as such. And if you hate her already, then you're going into the trial already biased against her. So that's why um, this is important. Do you know her personally? Do you know the defendant personally? That's an important question to ask. Next, do you or does any member of your family or close friend personally know or have past present dealings with Epstein, Jeffrey Epstein. So that's important as well because Epstein is connected to, Jeff, uh, connected to Gillian Maxwell and that might bias people uh, for or against her depending on the relationship. Next, uh, do you or family members or personal friends have past dealings with the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York, Audrey Strauss or Damian Williams or, or anyone else who works for the SDNY or used to work for the SDNY? Next question, do you or any member of your family or friends have past or present dealings with the assistant U.S. attorneys who are prosecuting this case? Uh, so you have to check yes or no. Maureen Comey, Allison Moe, Laura Pomerantz. Andrew Robach. So these are some of the AUSAs that are prosecuting this case. Relevant uh, bias information once again. Next, we move on to the defense lawyers. Um, similar question. Do you have any family connections or close personal friends who have worked with or have past dealings with the defense attorneys in this case? Uh, Christian Everdale, Jeffrey Pagluka, Laura Manager, Bobby Sternheim. Yes or no? Right. Uh, again, relevant question. So there, it, this is a totally fair process. They ask about the uh, U.S. attorneys here. Now they ask about the defense attorneys here. Next, we move on to the judge. So nobody's left off here. Do you or does your any of your family members or close friends um, have past or present dealings with the U.S. District Court judge who's presiding over this case, Allison J. Nathan, or anyone who works on her staff? So they tackled everybody there. They covered the judge, defense attorneys, and the prosecutors. Next, we move on to knowledge of the case and the people involved. Uh, once again, it's important to establish the amount of bias um, that people might have regarding Gillian Maxwell. Before today, had you read, seen, or heard anything about Ms. Maxwell? If yes, please state what you remember hearing, how, or from whom you may have heard it. Um, so they want you to uh, source what you have heard about or if you have heard anything at all. Have you personally formed an opinion about Miss Maxwell's guilt or innocence of the crimes charged as a result of anything you heard or read or seen? So this is important. This is to establish whether the jurors have already made up their minds about the guilt or innocence of Gillian Maxwell. If they have, then, they, then you can't have a fair uh, trial with people who have already decided that she's guilty or innocent, right? Based on anything that you have read, seen, or heard about Ms. Maxwell, including anything about criminal charges against Ms. Maxwell, have you formed any opinions about Ms. Maxwell that might make it difficult for you to be a fair and impartial juror in this case? Once again, related question, but very important for a fair trial. 
Have you verbally stated or posted your opinion on social media or online about Miss Maxwell or Miss uh, or Jeffrey Epstein? Moving on, based on anything that you heard, seen, or read about Jeffrey Epstein, have you formed any opinions about Mr. Epstein that might make it difficult for you to be fair and impartial in this case? So again, trying to establish, uh, trying to root out all bias, uh, asking about Jeffrey Epstein as well as Ghislaine Maxwell, because you know people who think that Jeffrey Epstein is innocent. Uh, tend to think that Gillian Maxwell is innocent, people like Alan Dershowitz, and people who think that Jeffrey Epstein was guilty tend to also so associate that guilt with Gillian Maxwell. So once again, a very important question to ask. If you have heard about Jeffrey Epstein, do you think Ms. Maxwell's alleged association with Jeffrey Epstein will make it difficult for you to fairly and impartially consider the evidence presented at trial and render a verdict based solely on the evidence? So once again, a very important question and uh, on point. And I think if we're all honest, some of the people watching Watching this video have already decided that Gillian Maxwell is guilty and they would not they would have to answer yes for this question so again it's important like I said I know my opinion and everybody watching this video has their opinion but in our legal system Gillian Maxwell is entitled to a trial and there is going to be a process where evidence is presented against her and the people who are going to participate in the jury in the trial process they have to judge uh, her guilt or innocence based on the evidence presented this is the process we have. People have to be found uh, guilty based on the evidence, not based on people's feelings. That's the system we have. You can like it or not, but that's what we got. Okay. And I think for the most part, it's a good system. And I personally think that she will be found guilty if fair minded people are sitting in this trial for this jury. Next, we have another important question. Based on anything you have read or seen or heard about Gillian Maxwell, including anything about criminal charges brought against Ms. Maxwell, would you be able to follow the court's instructions to put that information out of your mind and decide this case based only on the evidence presented at trial? Again, another hard question, okay? A lot of people, uh, not a lot of people, some people might not be able to do that. I personally, I can. Like, So I have my own opinion about what I think about Gillian Maxwell, but if I was sitting on this jury, I can definitely look at the evidence and render a fair judgment, despite the fact that I am uh, in some ways biased against her. But uh, as, a, as a rational person, as a scientific person, I can look at the case itself, uh, you know, separated from all the media attention, and all the stories that I myself have covered and you guys have heard. I can separate myself, but some people can't. That's why these questions are important. And you have to answer honestly. OK. So in the next part, they talk about the nature of the charges against Gillian Maxwell. We all know what they are. Uh, I've covered them in explicit details in my earlier videos when I started my Gillian Maxwell slash Jeffrey Epstein coverage. So check out my, check out my full playlist if you want to uh, dive into that. But we're not going to go into it right now. So I'm going to skip to the uh, closing question here. And uh, that one has to do with privacy. So the court does respect people's privacy, and that's why they ask this question. Do you wish for any particular answers to remain confidential and not to go beyond the judge, counsel, and the defendant because the answer would be would embarrass you or otherwise seriously compromise your privacy? So they give you the option of opting in for your questions to be uh, kept private and not released to anybody uh, other than the judge, counsel, and defendant. Okay, so they do give you that option of privacy. Next, we move on to the declaration part of the questionnaire where you swear that everything you have said here is the truth and you sign it basically by putting your jury a juror number here and signing it with the date. Okay, so next we have the draft war dear, which is a deeper delve into the potential biases of the jury, of uh, the potential jurors, and they ask detailed questions about whether the jurors can be fair and impartial when judging the case, whether they can be fair towards Gillian Maxwell, uh, given whatever prior knowledge they may have. Okay, so I'm going to go through some of the a couple of the questions here as well, but they're related to the prior questions we went through in the questionnaire. As I instructed you earlier, that's the judge speaking. One of the important principles of criminal law is that a defendant in a criminal case is presumed to be innocent. Like anyone accused of a crime in this country, Miss Maxwell is presumed innocent of any and all charges made against her unless and until the government proves her guilty beyond a reasonable doubt doubt. It is the government's burden to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt and the government's burden of proof alone. The defendant has no burden to prove her innocence or to present any evidence. Are you able to follow these instructions? Here are some relevant questions to whether a juror can be fair if they have heard of Gillian Maxwell before. Prior knowledge of Miss Maxwell. If juror has heard of Miss Maxwell, 
In your questionnaire, you reported that you heard of Ms. Maxwell before starting this process. Have you formed an opinion or have heard, read, or seen anything uh, about Ms. Maxwell that might make it difficult for you to be fair and impartial in this case? So as I mentioned earlier, these are going to be asked verbally. So the jurors are going to have uh, an opportunity to answer these questions in long form if they like. Obviously, these are not written questions. So this is just a draft proposal by the judge uh, to the public and to mainly the defense and the prosecution so they can know what the judge is going to ask these uh, potential jurors during voir dire. So there's a little bit of space left here. So don't think that these people have a small, tiny space to answer these questions because these are just proposed questions. The, the jurors are not going to be writing uh, the voir dire questions down. They're going to be answering the judge when he uh, when she asks the questions here. OK, so remember that uh, the next question is just the negative form of the first one, um, just making sure that that if the uh, juror reported that they didn't hear of G Maxwell, then they report that they didn't. OK, next, we have questions about Jeffrey Epstein and prior knowledge of Jeffrey Epstein. Again, asking similar questions. If the juror has heard of Jeffrey Epstein, can you be fair and impartial in this case? That's basically the question. And uh, similar in the negative, if you haven't heard of Jeffrey Epstein, is that accurate? Next, we move on to the nature of the charges. Um, the charges are regarding sex trafficking and conspiracy to sex trafficking. And the judge is basically trying to ascertain whether knowledge of charges would make it harder for you to be fair in this trial. Uh, again, similar vein to all the other questions, trying to establish fairness in the uh, in the mind of the uh, juror. Next, we move on to knowledge of the trial part participants. We kind of covered this before. If any of the jurors have worked with or personally are friends with any of the attorneys uh, from the prosecution side or the defense side or the judge or Gillian Maxwell, then they have to recuse themselves basically because uh, you can't be fair to people you know or work with. It might be a conflict of interest right? Or you might be considered to be biased. So you have to let the judge know if you're friends with Audrey Strauss or Gillian Maxwell or uh, Laura Menninger, who's uh, Gillian Maxwell, one of Gillian Maxwell's lawyers, uh, Pagluka, another lawyer. Uh, so you have to let the judge know if you are biased in favor or against any of the trial participants. Okay, so that's what this part is about. Prior jury service, uh, again, we already went through this. Have you served in a criminal trial before or a civil trial? And you have to know, you have to let the judge know what kind of trial it was and some of the details. Okay, so the last section here is about the juror background, basically asking questions about who you are as a person, your background, where you went to school, how old you are and where you work. Have you worked for the government? Things like that. Where do you work right now? How long have you been employed there? Uh, what kind of newspapers and magazines do you read? Are you on social media? What kind of television shows do you watch? What kind of radio programs or podcasts, et cetera, et cetera. So basic information about uh, who you are as a juror. Next, we have the final question from the judge here. I have tried to direct your attention in these questions and through the questionnaire you filled out to possible reasons why you might not be able to sit as a fair and impartial juror. Apart from any prior question, do you have any slightest doubt in your mind for any reason whatsoever that you will be able to serve conscientiously, fairly, and impartially in this case, and to render a true and just verdict without fear, favor, sympathy, or prejudice, and according to the law, as it will be explained. So that's the final question. The judge is asking, uh, aside from all the questions that have been asked here, do you have any doubt that you won't be able to be fair and just in this case. So again, a very important question given the structure of our legal system. So as I mentioned before, these are just draft questionnaires and draft voir dire. So the, the prosecution and the defense will have an opportunity to challenge some of the judge's wording or some of the questions that are being asked here. If they want some, something to be changed or excluded or included, they will have an opportunity to ask the judge to do that. But the judge will be the final determiner of what is going to be included in the questionnaire and the voir dire. That being said, I think that the questions that have been put forth by the judge are very fair. And for the most part, they try to get at all the biases, all the possible biases that the jury might have. OK, so that's the last word for me. I'll be doing another video when we get more information regarding this process going forward. I uh, hope you guys tune in for the next video. I know this one was kind of long, but I thought it was important to cover this. All right. Thank you so much for watching. As always, make sure to like the video, subscribe, hit the bell, press all for future videos. If you want to support my work, you can do so on Patreon. There'll be a link in the end of the video and in the description box. And you can also join channel memberships by clicking the blue join button down below. With that being said, see you guys next time. As always. Peace. It took a great deal of courage for her to confront the man who raped her. 
to tell him that in America, money and power do not tilt the scales of justice. It is up to the 12 of you to see that for once, she gets justice. Thank you.